Uh, please welcome tonight's speaker, Elisa Alexander. Thank you, John. Um, so nice to be back with so many friends that I've known for so long because I live in a world where people have only known me for five years and now I get to be back in a place where someone has known me since high school, which is slightly embarrassing, but also <laughs> really lovely. Um, and thank you for inviting me back after much hassling. And I was like, hey, hey, you should like, I wanna come back, I wanna come back, please. Um, please ask me to come back uh, because I love the Halley Ford so much and become a member because this is how museums support themselves. So I'll just echo that. Um, I'm gonna read the first and the last parts of my talk tonight uh, for various reasons. So bear with me, I will not be on my phone this whole time. So I just wanna start with um, a little exercise, and this is the most screens I've ever lectured in front of, too. So this, I feel like I'm at my own personal TED Talk. This is really fun. I'd like to begin my talk tonight with a familiar art historical convention, which is the slide comparison. On the left, we have this incredible painting by Raphael Peel, the first professional still life painter uh, in the United States. And we are looking at this work that is from the Met's collection that the Met acquired in 1959. While the painting abides by the conventions of the still life genre, the textural diversity of the objects that are represented, the fluffy crumb of the cake, the muted shine of the grapes, the transparency of the glass that is offset by the dark gradient background are all demonstrations of the artist's unique skill. Peel's father was, of course, Charles Wilson Peel, who founded the Philadelphia Museum, uh, which was one of the first museums in the United States, though it no longer exists in that exact same formation today. The Peel family and their contributions to American art are well documented by, for example, Stanford professor Alex Nemirov. So their you know, trials, tribulations, contributions are the stuff of art history already. So I don't really need to talk about Raphael Peel further here. On the right, you will see, on the other hand, a work by Toshio Aoki, who is one of the first artists of Japanese descent to forge a significant career in the United States. And this is one of very few, if not the only extant oil painting by this artist. He primarily made Japanese Nihonga style ink paintings. So this um, venture, this foray into uh, still life oil painting is incredibly unique from him. And what I love about this work is that it is, you know, unique for both its subject matter and also who, you know, what it says about him as an artist. It suggests both his status as an immigrant and his new home in the United States. The rounded teardrop forms of these bruised coral orange fruits indicate that, and they are more orange in real life, just to make a plug for always see a work of art in person, okay? Um, they are not this red. The bruised coral orange fruits indicate that they are likely the hachiya persimmon, a variety brought to California from Japan in the late 19th century after Japan finally opened itself up from trade in the mid 19th century after it had been closed for 250 years. The basket, which bears elements of Hopi design, though is not a faithful representation, and I'm also currently working with a scholar who thinks that it actually might be a basket of indigenous California design, which makes it even more interesting, perhaps refers to the popularity of indigenous baskets for collectors during the late 19th century in both the United States and Japan. So these are the elements that we're looking at. But in looking at this, I feel like Aoki is suggesting a number of things. And I have a lot of questions that are prompted when I look at this work. By featuring a basket of native design in this relatively spare composition for a still life, might this be his way of honoring the original occupants of American soil? Might he, as an immigrant, be particularly sensitive to indigenous presence during this moment when there were violent attempts at their physical and cultural erasure? Can we read these modeled persimmons as a stand-in for the artist himself, as they too are a Japanese export, bruised by the trials of being an immigrant in a racialized body? It is worth noting, however, that this particular variety of persimmon is best when it's soft and overripe and easily bruised, just like this. So maybe, actually, Aoki is saying, here I am, I'm here in my prime. Aoki utilizes the materials and conventions of a genre dominated by white Western male artists, a still life oil painting 
to fold together indigenous and immigrant histories, creating a kind of new world natur mort, you know, of native and Asian American intersectionality. The very existence of an image such as this challenges what we think we know about American art, who was making it, and when. Aoki re received relative success during his life. Uh, you know, he counted among his supporters J.D. Rockefeller um, and others, but he remains relatively unknown in art history. So here's a close-up of this work. So you're probably wondering, where did I find this painting? How did I come across something like this? Because I had never, up until this point, um, when I had seen it, ever seen a still life painting like this one. One that really spoke to Asian American presence in the 19th century. Well, I found it in a public storage unit in San Rafael, California, which um, you don't need to be an art expert to understand that this is not ideal storage for art, okay? If you do it, that's fine. You know, good for you for preserving history, but this is not where it should be. Um, and this is related to the, the Asian American Art Initiative that I co-direct at the Cantor at Stanford, uh, which I co-founded with art history professor Marcy Kwan, um, basically when I got there in 2018, but we went public with it in 2021. So what was I doing before I went public with it? We were doing historical research, we were doing visits, and then of course there was the pandemic, which kind of threw a wrench into everything. But I knew in order to do this work that I needed to amass a preeminent collection of Asian American art because you have to learn from objects themselves. Uh, and we didn't have hardly any of it. But at the same time that this was happening, a collector of Asian Californian art, Michael Donald Brown, passed away. And I had been in communication with him in his emails that were in all caps, which we just love receiving emails in all caps all the time telling me about his collection. And so when he passed away, I was the first person to gain access to the storage unit. And I went through the probably 400 plus pieces. And with the limited knowledge that I had, because there is just not that much published about this material, went through and picked out 141 works of art. And this forms the foundation of our historical collection at the Cantor Art Center. And you can see that the Aoki is here along with a bunch of other paintings that are sitting in our classroom to be processed and accessioned. And this was like July 2020. We were all masked. It was very hot in San Rafael. We spent a week looking at works, leaning against a you know, corrugated metal wall, which is not yeah. ideal like viewing conditions for any curator. But I think we did something really special. We got these works in, and then um, two years later, as part of the physical launch of the AAAI, which is what we call the Asian American Art Initiative, the AAAI, I mounted three exhibitions at the Cantor, the largest of which was called East of the Pacific, Making Histories of Asian American Art. And it's hard to tell, but the Aoki is off there in a far corner. And it was a survey of Asian American art um, from the 19th century to about the 1960s, when the term Asian American was coined by student activists in Berkeley in 1968. And I'll, talk, I'll speak more at length about this exhibition, but I just wanted to show you a little bit of the life of this artwork. For those of you who haven't been to my museum, I work at the Cantor Art Center, and so while my talk is supposed to talk about university art museums in general, I'm really just gonna talk about the one that I work at, so I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I will talk about the Halley Ford, but I thought I would use the Cantor as a case study, in part because this is where I always wanted to work. I always wanted to work at a university art museum, and I hope it will become clear as to why that is the case. Um, and I got extremely fortunate that straight um, out of my PhD program, I was hired in 2018, to help steward the wor works in this amazing collection in this completely strange museum in Palo Alto, but is actually one of the oldest university art museums on the West Coast. It was founded in 1894 by the Stanford family, actually before the university was founded because it was such a big deal to Jane Stanford that California have an art museum of this scale. It was bigger than the Met pre 19th century because of course our museum's been destroyed twice by two separate earthquakes, the 1906 Loma Prieta earthquake and then the 1989 earthquake. So, you know, we are, <laughs> we keep going. Our collection is more than 41,000 objects. It spans more than 5,000 years. We purport to be an encyclopedic museum, although we know that no museum can truly be that anymore. We have more than 40,000 square feet of exhibition space and five plus special exhibitions a year. Mm -hmm. Um, and we only have three curators right now, okay? That's like 
not a lot for all the objects that we have. There's me, because I'm in charge of modern and contemporary. We have a photo and new media curator and a European art curator. And we're gonna hire a prints and drawings curator, so if anybody uh, needs a job, um, that's coming up here pretty soon. So what is the AAAI? The AAAI is situated inside the Cantor, and it is unique nationally for what Marcy and I are doing. It is an indefinite, so this is very um, important because most racially or culturally or ethnically specific projects and universities have an expiration date. The university says, we'll invest in this for five years, and then you're done. You will hopefully have made an impact by then, not for us. This is an indefinite cross-campus project dedicated to the study of artists and makers of Asian descent, and it was co-founded by Marcia and myself, and it encompasses a range of activities, right? We build are working on building a preeminent collection of Asian American art. We put together exhibitions, we program academically and publicly, and we foster community outreach. Marcy teaches her courses out of my exhibitions. She teaches directly from objects that I never had exposure to here at Willamette or in graduate school. This is all stuff that most people don't have access to that we are teaching students directly from, which is so, so important to us. And we acquire archives. So if you wanna come write a dissertation about Ruth Asawa, you can come to Stanford because we have all of Ruth Asawa's papers. And right now we're working on our first book project. Um, we're, work, we're acquiring more archives and we're working with living artists. And there's a reason why we're doing it here at Stanford because Asian American presence has historically been so important and so foundational to the region and to the university. Does anybody know how Leland Stanford amassed his wealth? Railroad. The railroad. And who built those railroads? The Chinese. The Chine more than 20,000 Chinese migrants did the more treacherous and backbreaking work of building the railroads. And with that money, they founded the university that was also built by Chinese migrant labor. Every iconic palm tree on Palm Drive was planted by a Chinese laborer. So Stanford is an Asian American campus. You are looking at sherds from archeological digs that have happened around campus that have revealed to us the Chinese laborers' quarters that are all around us. It's a haunted campus, really. And it's very powerful in that way. And until recently, until my colleague, history professor Gordon Chang really did the work, we didn't know the full extent of their contributions to the history of our landscape. So we feel very indebted, right, to Asian American presence at Stanford. And I just want to go back to something the tremendous colleague, the great Margot Machida, said way back in 1990, where she said, at present, no museum scale setting is exclusively devoted to reflecting the richness and diversity of contemporary visual arts emanating from our numerous Asian national communities and generational groups, each with separate traditions, beliefs, and immigrant histories. The development of such institutions would correspond to those alternative spaces and museums that have been so successful in promoting other American ethnic and racial groups. So Margot was saying this in 1990, that there wasn't any place that paid attention to Asian American art in a significant way. And she was right. And so we still talk to Margot. Margot is still with us. And so with her leadership and her guidance and her blessing, Marcy and I you know, embarked on this work. I just wanna give you some numbers. And some of them are like real numbers because I also wanna to demonstrate to you like what it actually takes on a fiscal level to make something like this happen. The way that it requires a significant redistribution of resources, which means taking it away from realms that it has previously been allotted to, which makes a lot of people really uncomfortable, okay? But there's only limited resources in the world, but this is what it requires. Before I started, in 2018, we had 33 works of art by Asian American or Pacific Islander artists out of 41,000 works of art. I don't, I'm not good at math, but like, it's pretty bad, okay? Uh, right now, we have more than 500. So I've, you know, I've been acquiring and I've been doing it aggressively, but look at how long it's going to take me to make a really significant impact. If in five years, I mean, at least 100 works of art a year, but still, it's gonna take a long time. We have spent more than $2.3 million to acquire works of art by Asian American artists. We have received gifts of more than 250 works of art by 30 plus donors. And this, this number does not account for the funds that we have fundraised to acquire works of art. These are just gifts of art. 
I have personally fundraised more than a million dollars for the acquisition. This is not, like that 2.3 is part of it, and that's part of me working with the director, but me personally going out into the world asking for money for this, which, as I said in an earlier <laughs> class, I'm the child of an immigrant. You are not told to ask for money or ask for help. So this is a new skill I had to learn as an adult human being. Um, and it's something that all curators are expected to do nowadays. If you want something, you have to go out there and figure out how to get it. Uh, and you know, you would think that it would actually be really unpleasant, but actually it's quite meaningful to me because I'm connecting with Asian American donors. I'm connecting with people who want to help make this difference. So the way that I look at it is that you find people who are aligned with your mission, the people have, that have the means you know, to help support you in these projects. And that's what they've been doing. We've also received grants as well from the Terra Foundation and other entities, but really it's so much boots on the ground work. Um, you know, we were doing this work, Marcy and I, in kind of behind the scenes, really heads down. And then last year, we opened our first series of exhibitions and programs related to the initiative. And this was the first one. Uh, and that this is essentially a permanent installation. So if you come to the Cantor, which I hope you do, it's very beautiful. Stanford is an exceptionally beautiful campus. I went to UC Santa Barbara. It's a public school. It's on a beach. It has its own beach but nothing compares to like what a private university like Stanford can offer you. I hate to put it that way, but it's like, when I got there, I was like, oh wow, we're in like a different realm here. I take pictures of all the food that I get from Stanford because they like feed you all the time and I take pictures of it all the time because I still can't believe it. Um, so this opened in July, on July 6th in 2022. And so Ruth Asawa, some of you might know her, for us in the Asian American community, she is one of the most well-known artists, especially in the Bay Area. She is our Bay Area queen, and we love her. She is primarily known for these looped, hanging biomorphic sculptures that you can see in this title wall graphic that have gotten her much recent acclaim. They're going, New York MoMA is gonna do a retrospective of her work next year or the year after. But you know, she didn't enjoy all of this uh, fame during her life. It was only towards the latter part of her life, she died in 2013, that her work was being really picked up. But I had known about her work since graduate school, um, and I had always admired her practice because she represented to me a different model of what an artist could be. You know, so often in our history, we get told these stories about these guys that are in their studios and they're like chain smoking and drinking and then they're making paintings on the floor and it's like very dramatic and it's like very hard and you know very angsty. Asawa was not this person. Asawa was a woman who had six children, which okay that's and you were making art all the time. She had six children. She was working all the time. She was working at home in the domestic space. So the domestic space became this like incredible realm of creativity. There are these stunning photographs by one of her dear friends, photographer Imogen Cunningham, who took pictures of her in her home working. There's babies on the ground. She's looping wire. She's making food. She's having dinner parties. She's also an arts advocate. There's a high school in San Francisco named after her. She founded the first public arts high school in San Francisco. This is a Japanese American woman who was incarcerated during World War II under Executive Order 9066 with her family and learned to make art from Disney animators. That's where she learned to make art. And then she got out of it. She went to Black Mountain, which is like, that is the coolest school of all time. And she met her spouse there. And because they were an interracial couple, they moved to San Francisco because they wanted to be accepted. And she forged an incredible life and career there. And even though I loved her work, I didn't know that she did this. I didn't know that she had this practice of casting the faces of her friends, her family members, of other artists, Black Mountain artists, of people like Cyril Magnin, who was called the mayor of San Francisco, of all these gorgeous little elementary school students. And then she would hang these masks on um, the entryway to her house. So when you would go to her house in Noe Valley, you would just encounter this living archive of all the people that Ruth Asawa knew and loved. And I just thought, wow, that's such an incredible testament to who she is as a human being, the way that she saw the role of art in the world. And I only knew about this because her daughters, who were at the time helping steward her estate, came to the Cantor to help me install one of her looped wire sculptures. And they said to me, oh, you know, Elisa, did you know that our mom had this practice of doing this? 
And I was like, no, I had no idea. And they're like, yeah, you know, for a long time, we like didn't consider it to be art, but now we're looking for a home for it. And this was at the time that Marcy and I were like really conceptualizing the initiative and I needed some iconic acquisition. I needed something to like really make a statement about what we were doing. And this to me really belonged in the Bay Area too. Because she's such a Bay Area icon, because this was in her house, and because it also really expands what we know about her practice. This is a little how-to of making these masks. And so I thought, and also we have our archives. So I was like, we have to do this, even though it's like the most expensive work of art that the Cantor has purchased in recent memory. We went ahead and did it. Some of these, here's some of a cast of the incredible photographer, John Gutman, right? And then I love this photo that also has his mask in front of it, right? Uh, this is how it originally looked outside of her house. Uh, and these beautiful uh, wood shingles that she made over the course of 35 years. And if you sat for a mask, which this is like no small thing, because if you think about it, or any of you have ever done this, this is an incredibly claustrophobic enterpri enterprise. Your face is smeared with Vaseline, and you have to sit there while someone applies plaster to your face. You cannot open your eyes. You have little tiny little breathing holes, and you're stuck there. But that's such a testament to who Asawa was and her calming presence and the way that she could convince anybody to do anything. So I just love also what this work says about how people thought about her. And we installed it next to this inclusion, which I'm really proud about. And I think this is something that a university art museum can do that a place like SFMOMA cannot or would not because we are a place where we like to have interesting, difficult and critical conversations. So these are what I call Asawa's life vessels. When Asawa died, one of her last wishes was to have her ashes, the ashes of her late husband, Albert Lanier, and their late son, who died when he was young in his 40s, uh, Adam, mixed together with clay. And for her son, Paul, who was trained by the great German potter, Bauhaus trained potter, Marguerite Wildenhain at Pond Farm in Northern California, who is an artist, yes, yay for Pond Farm, um, to throw a set of vessels, one for each remaining Asawa child, and for this to be the vessel of their parents. Not an urn that held the ashes, but a vessel that was made of their ashes, right? Uh, she wanted to turn herself into a vessel that could hold fam flowers from the family garden. And Paul fired these in a unique way. If any of you have done wood firing, you know that this is an extremely lengthy, tedious, but fantastic process where a kiln must be stoked like once every 10 minutes for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, something like that. So you, work, you need a team. You can't do it by yourself um, unless you can stay up for a week. Uh, and it becomes almost this kind of ceremony, this ritual in itself. And when you put something in the kiln with wood firing, you don't exactly know how it's going to turn out because of, it depends on where you put it in the kiln, depends on other natural materials that are present in there. So you put it in there and what you receive afterwards is a gift, right? And so you'll see some of, that's why they look so different. There's some of them are slightly glazed. One has oyster shells stuck to the side. Uh, and I just really wanted to show viewers the way that Ruth Asawa thought about life and art, that even in death, she thought, this is how I want to live. And I just think it's one of the most powerful and beautiful representations of an artist thinking through their life in exp of an, an expansive way that I can think of. And some people find them very spooky. They find it weird to have somebody who's essentially, you know, it's a kind of human remains um, in these objects. But I think it provokes so many uh, amazing conversations that um, is what, that's what we want to do at a university art museum. I'm going to go through a couple of the other exhibitions that we showed last year related to the initiative. Um, this is one my colleague uh, organized because I'm not a specialist in photography or new media and they have their own special um, materials, constraints, requirements that I don't fully understand. But this is also a collection show. So this is photo and new media that we acquired um, by Asian Americans of Asian Americans. 
Uh, it was divided into two sections, representations of Asian Americans in the home space. I love these Michael Jangs, that finger point, right at the rice cooker. Um, his work, his San Francisco photographer as well, his work always has this kind of funny humor to it. And then Reagan Louie, um, the great Reagan Louie, who over the course of 40 years traveled back and forth between China and in doing so captured this incredible picture of a changing China. He was there in the 80s, in the 90s. He, you know, his family has been in the States for, on his mother's side, five generations because they've been here you know, since the beginning. And a couple of works by Mel John Ruperto where he focuses in on Isabel Rosario Cooper, who was a Filipina actress, but also the mistress to General Douglas MacArthur. And he found all of the footage that she was represented in, in films and stitched it all together, blurring out everybody else so that you would just focus on this person who would otherwise be considered a minor character. And we also borrow from special collections. Like I mentioned, we collaborate with Stanford Special Collections because our archives are very robust and it is another key thing about making sure that you not only have art objects but archives where you can access the type of material. And so we, we returned to East of the Pacific, um, which you know, was our opportunity to really show off the Michael Brown collection that I had acquired to give viewers a chance to encounter early Asian American material, as I'd explained to a class I visited today, in my mind, this was a chance to show Asian American history before Asian America, because the term was only coined in 1968. Actually, to call all of this material Asian American is kind of anachronistic, but I really wanted to show a kind of long presence, a long history of uh, Asian Americans making work in the United States. And even for most art historians who came, they were like, I don't know who most of these artists are. And that's a tragedy, but that's also what we can do at a university art museum because none of these artists have big names, right? And that's something that's very important to what we do. Uh, the Cantor doesn't charge admission. It never has, James Stanford made sure of it. What I do is not driven by revenue. It is driven by ideas. I was talking to a good friend of mine who's a curator at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, and he was like, Elisa, the only way that I can get an exhibition to pass, to cut mustard with the board, is if it will bring more than a thousand people in a day to the museum. If we can sell more than a thousand tickets, which like, I don't know how you figure out how to estimate that. Like, I have no idea where to even start. That means that's why everybody does a Yayoi Kasama show. Yes, those installations are great, but that's why they do it, right? They do it because it sells tickets. But what if you made a museum where the only thing you were interested in showing was ideas, right? The intellectual merit and value of something. Well, that's, that's what we do. So I don't ever have to worry. Whenever I bring an exhibition idea to our director, that is not my concern, and I don't ever want it to be my concern. I also can say things at a university art museum that I cannot say if I work at a big civic museum. And for example, I would just like to read to you the land acknowledgement that I wrote that greeted visitors upon entry to east of the Pacific. Land acknowledgements are all the rage right now, and I do think that they have a value, but I think there's obviously so much more that needs to be done. But I did feel like it was very important to make this statement at the beginning of East of the Pacific, where we say, Stanford occupies the ancestral land of the Moekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. On this land, Chinese migrant laborers helped construct the university and worked in the Stanford's residence. As president of the Central Pacific Railroad Company, Leland Stanford employed Chinese migrants to do the more hazardous, backbreaking work of building the Transcontinental Railroad. Between 1863 and 1869, 15 to 20,000 Chinese laborers helped execute one of the most ruthless engineering ventures in American history, a colonial project that displaced countless indigenous people and allowed the Stanfords to amass significant wealth. In 1882, the enactment of the first Chinese Exclusion Act effectively closed the door to Chinese immigrants and forced many Chinese migrants who were already living with the threat of violence to flee. So that appears on a large graphic wall that um, is an image that's drawn from Stanford's archive of a Chinese migrant worker working on Donner Pass, which was one of the more treacherous passes in the Sierras to build the railroad. Uh, 
when you're a curator or somebody goes to museums a lot, when you go to a museum and you read the text, you can tell when people are being censored. You can tell when people have had all the teeth and all the guts taken out of what they have to write or what they can share. And I see it all the time. And nobody takes the guts out of what I want to write. And that's what we can do. You know, it is our job as an institution to be critical of where we come from and what we do and what are the stakes of what we're doing and who was here before. So I'm very grateful that uh, nobody said anything at Stanford when I wanted to put this up. I didn't really like pass it through leadership like I probably should have. I just did it. Um, and then they were like, oh, yes, great job. Yep, 100 percent. We were behind this the whole time. Just ask for forgiveness. Don't ask for permission. Um, here's another installation of uh, the East of the Pacific from this great section uh, where we feature two artists, one of whom might be known to some, Chira Obata, uh, the great um, early 20th century uh, printer, woodblock printer and painter, and then Wing Kwong Se, who's probably rather unknown. Here's another kind of story I want to tell in East of the Pacific. So. These are the kind of donors that I get to work with who are particularly meaningful to me. Pat Hayashi was born in the Topaz incarceration camp in Utah um, during World War II. And I use the word incarceration very specifically because many of those who are of Japanese descent who experience this do not feel that internment properly reflects the experiences that they had of being forcibly removed from their homes, all of their personal belongings lost, all of that generational wealth lost, and being re relocated to camps. You know, he said to me once, camp means something very different to me than it does to other people to go camping or a camp, right? So Pat reached out to me, and he had a very modest but very powerful collection of work about Japanese American incarceration. And he is a Berkeley alum, which if anybody knows anything about the Bay Area, Berkeley and Stanford, OK? If you're a Berkeley person, you do not give stuff to Stanford. But uh, Pat, after you know, he, um, he grew up in the 60s, he was at Berkeley. He was part of the student activists that helped crown, uh, coin the term Asian American. He then became vice chancellor of admissions at UC Berkeley, where he fought against the use of standardized testing in college admissions because he believed them to be racist and improper judges of merit. So I'm like, Pat, you are my hero. I love you already. And so this is what he spent his career doing. And so he uh, gifted his collection to us. And it's been an incredible joy to learn from him. And those works um, appeared in East of the Pacific. I'm going to go through some other elements a little quickly, but I also just wanted to show you the different ways that we engage with this material. Yes, we show it, but we do a lot of other things, too. Um, so some of you might like really like audio guides in museums or audio tours. I am not personally one of those people. In fact, I never do them. I never take the audio guide because I don't really need somebody to narrate to me a thing that I can read on a wall label. I need an audio guide to perform a different function. So I took it as a task to reimagine what it could do. And we commissioned the Asian American Performance Group that is called For You Productions to take my checklist for East of the Pacific, go into the Bay Area arts community, and talk to elders and have them respond to, to these works of art and record their responses. And sometimes these responses really actually don't have anything to do with the works of art themselves. But in doing that, they create a completely different kind of experience and looking and feeling and viewing these artworks. And all these tours are available on the Cantor website, so you can still kind of go through and look at them. But what you're seeing is a layout of the exhibition. So there was, it was almost like a dance. There was a place where you started, and you had little cues in, when you were listening to it to move on. And this is us working together, also during the pandemic, figuring out like, how we would actually do this thing. Um, and we, you know, they really interviewed you know, fifth generation Japanese American farmers, because those, ha those figures have been so essential to Japanese uh, or to American agriculture and that history, which most people don't know about, which is very prevalent in the Bay Area. More in survivors of um, Japanese incarceration and community members in SF Chinatown. And then I, I have to share this like kind of just project that just came out of nowhere, but we just figured out how to do it. So this is a drawing that artist Chira Obata 
made um, in Tanforan, which was one of the early detention centers, the first places that you would land as a Japanese American when you were forced uh, to leave your house. And this is honestly, there's a shopping mall now in Tanforan in the Bay Area. So it's, it's totally weird. Um, but that's where they would first go. And so he made this incredible document of some of the first vegetables that the incarcerated grew in the camps. And I loved this drawing. His family, his granddaughters gave us 33 works of art in support of the initiative. And I looked at it and I was just like, oh, what can we do? And in the Bay Area, I'm also a gardener. There is this incredible historic seed company called Kitazawa Seed Company that was founded by Japanese American brothers who were also incarcerated during World War II. And I wanted to make something for the opening. So I was like, wouldn't it be so cool? Because their packaging for us in the Bay is so iconic. It's like on these little manila envelopes and it's always, you know, these green drawings and designs of the vegetables. I was like, what if we put one of Obata's drawings on the package and like made something special for the opening? But Kitazawa got so excited that they produced it for sale. Um, and they picked a variety of Japanese turnip, a heritage variety of Japanese turnip that could have been grown and planted in a camp. So they thought about it that hard. They're like, this is an open pollinating variety of Japanese turnip. This could have actually been grown in the camp, which is just like after my own heart. And I wrote the text on the back and the, you know, the QR code linked to our website. So it really just became, it's like my favorite pet project that came out of last year. I don't know if any of them are still around. This was like, the Obata family was like, well, you've made our Christmas gifts, so <laughs> thank you. We're just gonna send this to everybody. And in addition to exhibitions, um, my co-director Marcy, who I've not spoken of much, but is like my partner in crime, the woman I couldn't do any of this without, she uh, is the professor in the project who does the research, she does the teaching, and she, along with some of our colleagues at Stanford Arts, organized this incredible who's who convening of Asian Americans in the arts, unlike anything that had ever been seen in our generation. So we brought more than 40 artists, scholars, curators to Stanford or for two days, um, and we got Kathy Park Hong, for those of you who know who she is, icon, author of Minor Feelings, to come be in discussion with Marcy. Uh, and all of these talks are recorded, they're available on our website. And these are some of our speakers who like, I don't know when we're ever gonna get all of these people in a room again. I still think about this convening all the time because there's such power just in bringing people together to have a conversation. So this was something that happened last year um, during the run of the exhibitions. And then, like I mentioned, um, we also work with Special Collections, uh, which is its old different arm of Stanford. It's not part of the museum, but it is part of the university. And we acquire archives of folks like Ruth Asawa, of the artist Bernice Bing, of May's Photo Studio, which ran pretty much like the James Van Der Zee equivalent of uh, a photo studio in San Francisco Chinatown. So for those of you who know James Van Der Zee's photography in Harlem, he captured iconic images of Harlem life in the early 20th century. And our equivalent in Asian America is May's Photo Studio. We also, as our first research project, did a catalog raisonné, which if anybody has done one of those, you know what a tremendous nightmare and how difficult and how challenging those are. But we wanted to make an open source catalog raisonné of the queer Chinese American SF raised artist, Martin Wong. And so that is fully available on the Stanford website where you can search all the paintings he ever made. And we were gifted one as part of this project. So I have an incredible Martin Wong in the Cantor's collection. And that's just the kind of, you know, doing that kind of work, that kind of research is, and making that available is what it's all about at a university because we want dissertations to come out of this. Like Marcy and I can't write all the books, we can't do all the things, but all of you can, all future students can, right? And when you put it out there, hopefully people will come. In addition to all of that, uh, Marcy and I contribute extensively to publications. We write a lot um, about Asian American artists sometimes for scholarly publications, sometimes for museum catalogs. Um, this great Ruth Asawa drawing show just opened at the Whitney called Through Line, and I was 
lucky enough to be able to contribute to that catalog. Uh, we're just trying to really put the word out there. So basically this is everything that we do and we do it because we have support from the university, but we also seek support. We also do it because we feel an obligation to do this kind of work. And honestly, I don't think that there's anything more meaningful that you can do. Sometimes the word obligation comes with a terrible connotation. Oh, like I'm obligated to do these things. But actually, obligation to me comes from a very deep place of respect and recognition. So I feel very grateful that this is literally what I get paid to do. And I wouldn't have ended up here if it wasn't for a place like the Halley Ford, which I'm so grateful to have spent so many years working at. And Jonathan, I just like made up my title. I don't really know what my title was when I was working there. So I was like, I'm just going to call myself a museum collections intern and like pretend that that's what it was. And when you're someone who travels as much as I do and, and sees enough art or goes to enough museums, museums start to look all the same especially when it comes to contemporary art. They show the same things, you know, you have a big Anish Kapoor or a Takashi Murakami, or, you know, you have your wall of Mark Rothko's, um, you have your Jeff Koons, like you can go to Dubai, you can go to New York, you can go to San Francisco, you can see all of the same artists. And that gets super boring after a while. So my question is, in a world where art museums look increasingly homogenous, what can a university art museum do? Well, I think it can do stuff like this, because where can you go see a Carl Hall, which, you know, that one is right on the other side of this wall. Um, you can go see an incredible collection of Pacific Northwest art that is otherwise unavailable, because once you leave here, that kind of stuff is not accessible. That's not always apparent, right? This is the history that you can steward and preserve. You can invest in your region, you can invest in your community, you can tell the stories that not everybody else is telling because maybe you don't really care about ticket sales as much, although I know that that's like an important thing, but like, you know what I'm saying? It's about more than that. And you know, just for a little fun fact, this incredible Marie Watt blanket stack, I knew of Marie Watt from when I was an undergrad because Marie was like maybe one of the more famous undergrads that um, have come out of the program. So for me, she was always like top tier. Even though most of my work um, is about Asian American art, I am in charge of the modern and contemporary collections. So actually at the Cantor, we are working on acquiring a very large Marie Watt sculpture that was installed here, um, that we have time-lapse footage that Jonathan shared with me. Actually, the gallery shared with me and I was like, excuse me. I know exactly where that footage was taken. That is my like OG home. That is my first museum home. And so it's all kind of just like coming full circle to be able to support an artist like Marie who's doing such important work with indigenous heritage who I would probably not otherwise have known about if it wasn't Willamette, although now she's, she's blown up into the stratosphere. But back in the day, you know, we all start somewhere. And I, curated my first shows at the Heli Ford. Um, and please don't read that description because I wrote that so long ago and it is so embarrassing, but you know, this is what is available on the website. I hope we all go back and look at um, the things we, we write and feel embarrassed because it's like a good marker. But then when you look at it, you're like, oh my God. Um, but this was my first exposure was with contemporary art, was with Dan May, the beloved Dan May, who is one of a kind, someone who truly embraced life as an art form and art as life. And I, I mean, like I knew him from like serving him at the coffee shop that I worked at. But now looking back, I'm like, wow, Dan was like really, really amazing. And I'm so grateful that I got to work with him while he was still alive. So, you know, most people in the museum world, like it takes a long time for you to be able to do your first museum show. and. I think I was like a junior here when it happened and it was small, it was up in the study center, but it meant a lot to me. And it really got me thinking about what does it mean to invest in an underrepresented history? What does it mean to invest in a region? What does it mean to work with living artists? Here's, we get to, we get to the hard part now. So you have to help me keep it together. Something that Marcy and I talk about all the time is that the work that we do as art historians is not something that we invented out of thin air. Like maybe I made it look like that when I was talking about the AAAI, but like we really didn't invent that out of thin air. It wouldn't exist if it weren't for the advocacy of previous generations, 
the work of older scholars and curators, some of whom we know with great pleasure and some of whom we no longer know anymore because they've since passed on. As historians, Marcy and I know that we always sit on the shoulders of others and it allows us to reach the fruit that was just out of reach for our elders, right? And it allows us to plant new trees that we will never see come to fruition in our lifetimes. So tonight, the person that's actually been in this room the whole time who I haven't talked about, but who's made a lot of this possible for me and others um, is Roger Hall, who we lost two weeks ago today. He ascended to the ancestral plane, as I like to call it. And it's really hard to be back right now, but I'm very grateful actually to be back during this moment. Um, it's actually kind of comforting to be here. And I um, had the great pleasure and honor of writing a piece for Oregon Arts Watch about Roger. And so I'm just gonna close with reading um, the end of that piece because I think like so many things, he was so wise and it has informed so much of the way that I think about life and art. So for those of you who had the great pleasure of knowing Roger, you undoubtedly heard him say often, quote, the work of the art historian is never done. Like many Rogerisms, this statement may seem simple on the surface, but at its core is quietly profound. Of course, you know, there will always be another artist to write about a different historical moment to capture or explore, more archives to find and sort, and more shows to curate. And that's part of the appeal of art history is that it never ends and it never should end. But this is how I really understood Roger's iconic catchphrase. The art historian's job is not to foreclose meaning of a work of art. Instead, it is to explode it, to elucidate all that is possible embedded within each work. A painting, sculpture, or photograph isn't a problem to be resolved. In fact, each one is a universe unto itself, and any single interpretation offered should never foreclose the possibility of others. To me, his statement expressed an awareness that being a historian means dedicating your life to pursuing something that will always exceed your individual ex existence. Whatever you choose to write about will open different narratives and intellectual paths to be explored by others. So by very virtue of being an art historian, your work will never be done. Your contributions will impact the scholarship of future generations as they build on it in ways that are powerful and surprising and unanticipated. I'm sure that Roger never thought his work on Pacific Northwest modernism would help shape someone's thinking on Asian American art history, but it has and continues to do so. In my grief, itself a reflection of my deep love for him, it comforts me very much to know that his work, <clears throat> his work is not yet done, that it lives on in his students, in his family, in his colleagues, and it lives on in all of us in a small way. May we all serve as supportive shoulders for future generations. So rest in peace, Roger Hall. Yeah, that's a very good question, and um, I'm really glad you brought it up because these first projects were very East Asia focused, and that is in part due to the history of Asian American presence in the Bay. But my next projects that open next year, which we will have three shows, so my life is a nightmare right now, we will have three shows opening next fall related to the AAAI, and the primary one is grounded in Thailand. So it's a very personally meaningful project to me. It is of the Thai and Thai diaspora. I've gotten to work through this project with one, to me, is an icon. This is like one of my favorite moments of working at Stanford. For those of you who are real super big time film nerds, Thailand's preeminent avant-garde filmmaker is named Apicha Pong Weiratesakun, and he, his most famous film is Memoria with Tilda Swinton, but he also did this film called Uncle Boon Me, Who Can Recall His Past Lives, and like, his filmography is so incredibly powerful to me, and he came to Stanford, and we had dinner and he did a screening and so now he's part of this project. And so um, he's not Asian American, but we are all connected through this kind of diaspora. Like I understand Pichoy is what he goes by, Pichoy's films because of my experience growing up in Thailand. And there's something to be said there about the way that we move, we live across continents, artists go back and forth. 
we all have interesting and varied lives, and works of art can reflect that. So um, that's part of what the next show will be. We try to be really super expansive, but it's just the two of us. So it's gonna take time, but luckily, it's an indefinite project, so I don't have to worry about getting things done in the next two to three years. I got a while, so thanks for asking that. Yeah, Jonathan. Thirty-three. Yep. Uh, and your background coming in was working with a lot of felt art from the south. Yeah. How? What? What was the? What, like, how did you? How did you shift gears, and why? Like, where did that come from, and, and where was there support already there for that? Or can you talk about this a little bit? But I'm just kind of curious about how that, how you shifted gears towards this area. Folks. Yeah. Well, you know, even here. Um, at Willamette, Ricardo also was the one who introduced me to the work of a lot of so-called self-taught or outsider artists. So I've actually, in the, the way that I look at it is that I've always had an interest in those historically excluded, marginalized, underrepresented narratives, whether that, that be because of neurodivergence or um, social class, right, or geographical location. Um, my dissertation working on black artists in the Deep South in a post-civil rights moment comes out of that interest because, well, my colleagues in graduate school were like, see you later, I'm going on a research trip to the Netherlands, I'm going to Paris, that's so fun. I'm like, I'm going to Alabama, I'll see you all later. Uh, and I had the best time, you know, because I grew up primarily on the West Coast. The South was like unknown territory to me, and now I have a firm belief that you actually don't really understand what it is to be an American or what constitutes the United States until you spend significant time in the Deep South. It is not all bad. It's complex, it's profound, it's totally changed my life. Um, and working with living artists down there really did that for me. And, you know, as I was also talking to a class today, once you have the training, the armature to be an art historian, it actually doesn't matter the content of what you study. It's your critical fac faculty, it's your perspective, it's your intellectual rigor, and you can bring that to bear on any topic of your choosing, which is a good lesson for being an art historian. Um, so I still do have investment in the artists that I worked with in my dissertation. I have another show opening in January at the Jewel Collins Smith Museum uh, at Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama, that's based off of my dissertation. So it's not like I've let it go. And also, I will say that black artists Black art historians, black curators pave the way for what we can do as Asian Americans because black curators, historians, and artists have been the stewards of their own legacy for a very long time. They have been the ones who have been writing foundational texts in black studies that have deeply informed the way that Marcy and I think about the work that, they're, that we are doing. Of course, there's differences. The experiences of black Americans and Asian Americans are not analogous in any way, but they have helped give us the framework to how to think through the issues that are similarly at stake for us. So it's all related. And then when I got to the Bay, I was like, wow, I never thought I would live in an art world that was so Asian American because I went to college here. I'm sorry, but like <laughs> I was often the only person in the room, right? And that was very, the only Asian American in the room, sometimes the only person of color in the room. And that was really alienating and difficult. And like, I kind of didn't really realize that until I left. And I just felt like I could breathe, you know? Um, and so I loved my time here and I loved everything that I learned. But then when I ended up in an art world where my co colleagues, other curators, other artists, other gallerists, other museum workers were Asian American, I was like, wow, this is an art world that I really love being in. This is a community that I feel really invested in. And these are the kinds of stories I want to tell because how much does it truly make sense to like, feel like, I only care about telling narratives from the Deep South when you live in the Bay Area, when you have so many amazing artists living and working in the Bay Area that deserve your support and your attention. So it's all connected because it's all art. But thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. Ah, Rachel. <laughs> Involved 
Yeah, I mean, Marcy works with students a lot. She has a small army of students that are working with her all the time. Her next book project, um, Marcy is uh, of Korean descent, Korean American descent, is about the history of San Francisco Chinatown. And she does not know Mandarin, she doesn't know Cantonese, but we have plenty of students who do. We have plenty of students who understand the stakes of that history in ways that we do not. So she works with them. The Cantor has a robust um, program of working with students. We have student guides. We have student interns. We have all sorts of students who help us. And um, I don't work with them as directly, unfortunately. Um, but the those around me who work in our academic and public programs department really do. So um, it's also just uh, like getting the work in front of them, you know, so that they can do whatever they want to do with it. That they can, you know, think about it in ways that are powerful and surprising and unexpected in ways that I wouldn't have thought of. Um, it's just putting the objects out there and putting the stories out there. And so that's sort of like the way that I feel my role is really powerful, is just being able to provide them access um, to these types of objects that they wouldn't otherwise have had access to. Well, it gave me a framework to think about my own experience in a way. And, um, you know, I think when I started, I was like, well, what do I have to think through or say? I'm, because I do not belong to the most represented diaspora. Um, so I was like, well, should, you know, wouldn't it, would it be more useful if I was like Chinese or Japanese descent or whatever? But actually, all that kind of stuff doesn't really matter as much, right? What it does is we, it allows us, Marcy, all of our students to recognize the larger institutional structures that have helped frame for better or worse our experiences in the United States, but also our, how our individual experiences are meaningful and how those distinctions are actually kind of what make us special and that whether or not that has to do with our racial background, which of course, you know, Race is a social construct that impacts our life in very material ways. Um, it's helped give me perspective on my own life in that way, and also seeing the way that, like myself, artists go back and forth across the globe. That when you say something like Asian American, people are always like, oh, what does it mean? How do you define it? And like, actually, I like, don't care about this question very much because we want to think about it expansively. And if anything, artists always are the ones to lead the way. They show you that. They're like, well, I might live in the United States for 20 years. Maybe I'll go back to the Philippines. I'll do whatever I want. And you can define me however you want or whatever, but I'm just going to make work. And you follow their path, and you follow their lives, and their lives make the things that you think about more complicated in ways that are really rich and exciting. And um, I look to them, and I think about those kind of transcontinental experiences, and it helps me think through my own transcontinental experiences. Uh, and you know, in that way, uh, I see myself as part of this community, even though my individual experience is really unique in relationship to a lot of people I know. Um, I'll, if I go back, I am very close friends with um, so many artists I've gotten to know through this project, but uh, this, uh, the photographer Reagan Louie is now like one of my very close friends. He's 72, and I think, Bonnie, you'll appreciate this. <laughs> Reagan was like, because uh, he just has, he has an, a show up at SFMOMA right now. He's like, Elisa, they described me as the beloved photographer, Reagan Louie. And I'm pretty sure you only get to be called beloved after you turn 70. So I, whenever I use the word beloved in relation to Roger, I was like, <laughs> I'm doing, <laughs> doing this because Reagan said it was OK. But, you know. but he's 72, and he just went surfing in Indonesia. So like, I don't know. Time is also a construct. People are, live amazing lives. Um, but you know, Reagan and I have had the most generative and rich conversations of my life. And like I said, he's descended from like five generations of Chinese presence in California. We have hardly any overlap, but it's really just feeling like you are being seen by another human being. And I feel like Reagan and I really see each other as human beings. And um, like my friendship with Roger, for me, that kind of intergenerational dialogue has always been one of the most important things in my life. And so 
getting to do that through this project has also been really meaningful.